Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here and you're somebody who enjoys listening to horror stories, click subscribe down below and join us. Please leave a like before we get started. Thank you. It was a beautiful Sunday afternoon in Wisconsin. The sun was shining, the birds were chirping, and the smell of a home-cooked meal filled the air. My family had gathered at my house for our weekly Sunday dinner, a tradition that we had been doing for as long as I could remember. We were all laughing and catching up with each other, enjoying each other's company. As the oldest of four siblings, I always took on the role of hosting our family dinners. It was a way for me to bring everyone together and create lasting memories. My parents, my two younger sisters, and my little brother were all there, along with my husband and our two children. It was a full house, but we loved it that way. After dinner, we all sat around the living room chatting and playing games. I could see the happiness and contentment on my dad's face as he watched his family laughing and having a good time. He had always been the rock of our family, the one who held us all together. I couldn't imagine what life would be like without him. As the evening went on, my dad started to complain of a headache. He brushed it off as just being tired from a long day at work and the excitement of having everyone over. But as the night went on, his headaches seemed to get worse. He started to become more and more quiet, and I could tell that something was off. I pulled my mum aside and expressed my concerns about my dad. She agreed that something didn't seem right, and suggested that we take him to the hospital. My dad protested, not wanting to ruin our family dinner. But we all knew that his health was more important than one night together. We quickly got my dad into the car and drove to the nearest hospital. As we waited in the emergency room, my dad's headache became unbearable. He was in so much pain, and I felt helpless. Finally, we were called back to see a doctor. After a few tests, the doctor came back with a grave expression on his face. I'm sorry to say this, but your father has suffered a stroke, he said. My heart dropped. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My dad, the strongest man I knew, just had a stroke? The doctor explained that my dad had lost control of the left side of his body and that it was a permanent damage. I couldn't hold back my tears as I watched my dad lying in the hospital bed unable to move his left arm and leg. The next few days were a blur. My dad was in the hospital, and we were all taking turns staying with him, making sure he was comfortable and had everything he needed. The reality of the situation started to sink in, and I couldn't help but feel scared and overwhelmed. My dad had always been there for us, and now he needed us more than ever. After a week in the hospital, my dad was able to come home. The doctor said that with his physical therapy, he could possibly regain some movement in his left side, but it would be minimal. That was a bit contrary to what the doctor said before, but this was a different one. He said that it would take a long time, and it would be very difficult, however. My mum and I took on the role of his caregivers, helping him with everyday tasks and taking him to his therapy appointments. It was hard to see my dad struggle. He'd always been so independent and strong, and now he needed help with even the simplest of tasks. But he never complained once. He was determined to get better and be there for his family. As the weeks went by, my dad's progress was slow but steady. He was able to regain some movement in his left arm, 
but his leg remained weak and unresponsive. It was hard for him to accept that he would never fully recover, but he never let it bring him down. He continued to push himself, and we were all so proud of him. But the stroke not only affected my dad physically, it also took a toll on our family emotionally. My mom was overwhelmed with caring for my dad and tried to keep up with the household tasks. My siblings and I were struggling to balance our own lives while also being there for our dad and helping out as much as we could. We all had to make sacrifices. Family dinners were no longer the same as we had to adjust to my dad's new needs. Instead of laughing and playing games, we now had to help my dad with his meals and make sure he was comfortable. It was a difficult adjustment, but we were determined to make it work. As the months went by, my dad's condition remained the same. He had reached a plateau in his recovery, and we were all starting to accept that this was our new normal. But, we refused to let it define us. We still had our family dinners, even if they looked a little different now. And my dad was still the rock of our family, even if he couldn't physically do everything he used to. Despite the challenges, we were grateful that my dad was still with us. We knew that things could have been much worse, and we cherished every moment we had with him. He was still the same caring, loving, and supportive dad, and we were all so thankful for that. Unfortunately, as time went on, my dad's health continued to decline. For a while he was getting better, but as we got to 12 months after the stroke, things went downhill very slowly after the plateau. I knew it was time to make a difficult decision. My father's health had been declining pretty slowly, but he suffered a second stroke. This was what really hit him on the head. He was no longer able to care for himself, and it was becoming increasingly difficult for my mother and I to take care of him at our family home. The thought of selling our beloved home was heart-wrenching. It held so many memories of my childhood, and I couldn't imagine leaving it behind. However, I knew that it was the only way we could afford to downsize to a more manageable property and provide my father with the constant care he needed. It had been a few weeks since I made the decision, but I still couldn't bring myself to tell Dad. He'd always been a strong and independent man, and the thought of having to rely on others for his basic needs was something that I knew would be hard for him to accept but I couldn't let him suffer any longer, so I gathered my courage and sat him down one evening to break the news. As expected, he was hesitant and resistant at first, but after much persuasion and reassurance that it was for the best, he finally agreed to move. With a heavy heart, my mother and I started packing up our home, getting rid of things we no longer needed, and preparing for the move to a smaller, more manageable property. It was a bittersweet feeling, leaving behind the place where I'd spent most of my life, but I knew that my father's health was the priority here. After weeks of searching, we finally found a small but cosy house on the outskirts of town. It was perfect for my father's needs, a single-story home with no stairs, a small backyard, and close to all the necessary amenities. The only thing left was to find a carer for my father. We'd heard about a website called Craigslist, where people advertised their services for various jobs. I was a bit hesitant at first, but with limited resources and time, I decided to give it a try. My mum still worked part-time, as they were still paying off some debts. I worked full-time and so did my husband so we realized that caring for dad was becoming increasingly impossible after his second stroke. To my surprise, I received several responses within hours of posting an ad for a live-in carer. After sifting through numerous applications and conducting thorough background checks, I finally found a suitable candidate. Her name was Sarah, 
and she seemed like the perfect fit for our family. She had four years of experience caring for the elderly, and her references were glowing. I immediately felt a sense of relief, knowing that my father would be in good hands. Sarah arrived at our new home a few days before the move. She was a middle-aged woman with a warm smile and a gentle demeanor. My father took an instant liking to her, and I could tell that he was already feeling more at ease with the idea of having someone else take care of him. As we settled into our new home, Sarah's presence was a comforting one. She took charge of my father's care and handled everything with such ease and compassion that it put my mind at rest. However, things started to take a strange turn after a few weeks. My father's health had been stable since the move, but suddenly he began to experience severe stomach pains and nausea. At first, we thought it was a side effect of his medication, but as the days went by, his condition only seemed to get worse. He was losing weight rapidly, and his once bright and lively personality was fading away. My mother and I were out our wits end, trying to figure out what was causing his sudden decline in health. One day, as I was going through some of my father's old belongings, I stumbled upon a small box of pills that Sarah had left behind. I didn't think much of it at first, assuming they were just some over-the-counter medication for my father's pain, but as I looked closer, I noticed that they were not prescribed by his doctor. In fact, they are a type of medication that was used for euthanasia, a lethal dose of drugs to end someone's life. My heart raced as I realized the gravity of the situation. I immediately confronted Sarah and demanded an explanation. At first, she denied any wrongdoing, claiming that the pills were for her own personal use. But as I pressed on, she finally broke down and confessed to her plan. She had been slowly poisoning my father, hoping to accelerate his decline and ultimately cause his death. I was filled with a mixture of shock, anger and disbelief. How could someone who had trusted with my father's care turn out to be a monster? Without hesitation, I called the police and had Sarah arrested. She was charged with attempted murder. And it was discovered that she had a history of preying on vulnerable elderly people. My father was rushed to hospital, where he underwent a series of tests and treatments to flush out the poison from his system. It was a terrifying and traumatic experience, but thankfully he made a full recovery. As I sat by my father's bedside in the hospital, I couldn't help but feel guilty for putting him in a vulnerable position. I had trusted a stranger to take care of him, and it nearly cost him his life. But my father, being the kind and forgiving person that he was, reassured me that it was not my fault. He reminded me that we had to make difficult decisions for his care, and we couldn't have foreseen this horrific turn of events. After the incident, my father was transferred to a reputable care facility, and we ensured that he received the best care possible from trained professionals. As for Sarah, she was sentenced to prison for her heinous crimes, and I made it my mission to spread awareness about the dangers of trusting strangers with the care of our loved ones. It was a painful experience, but it taught me the importance of being vigilant and vigilant when it comes to the safety and well-being of our family members. In the end, we were forced to sell our family home in Wisconsin and downsize again to an even smaller property. Dad's care cost thousands upon thousands every single month. It was stressful, but we managed to make it work. I no longer felt the sadness and reluctance that I had felt before. 
Instead, I felt grateful that we were able to get my father the care he needed and protect him from malicious intentions of a stranger. Our new home may not hold the same sentimental value as our old one, but it was a safe and peaceful haven for my father in his final years, and that was all that mattered. He passed away in 2018. Thank you everyone for your kind wishes, and be careful out there. I never thought I would end up like this, homeless, jobless, and with no one to turn to. But here I am, sitting on a cold bench in a rundown park, my only belongings in my backpack and a few crumpled bills in my pocket. It all started when I lost my job as a high school janitor. I'd been working at the same school for over 15 years and I'd always taken pride in my work. I made sure the hallways were spotless, and the bathrooms were sparkling, and the classrooms were tidy. I was always the first one in, and the last one out, making sure everything was in order before the students arrived, and after they left for the day. But then one day, everything changed. The school board decided to cut costs and outsource the janitorial services to a cheaper company. I was devastated. This job was all I had. I never went to college or pursued any other career. I was content with my life. I liked the routine, the simplicity of it all. But now, I was faced with the reality that I had to find a new job. I started applying for every janitor position I could find, but at my age, it wasn't an easy task. Most places were looking for younger, more physically fit workers. I was in my late 50s, and my body was starting to feel the toll of all those years of hard labor. I didn't give up though. I kept applying and going to interviews, hoping that someone would give me a chance. Months went by and I still couldn't find a job. I had no income coming in and my savings were quickly depleting. I tried to cut back on expenses, but rent was my biggest worry. I lived in a small studio apartment in a not so great neighborhood, but it was all I could afford on my janitor salary. Now, with no job, I knew I wouldn't be able to pay rent for much longer. I tried to reach out to my family for help, but they were struggling with their own financial issues and couldn't offer me any assistance. I didn't have many friends either. Most of my co-workers were acquaintances at best. I'd always been a loner, and now I regretted not making more of an effort to form meaningful connections. As the days went by, I became more and more anxious about my situation. I started to fall behind on rent, and my landlord was not the most understanding person. He gave me a final warning, saying that if I didn't come up with the rent money by the end of the month, I would be evicted. I didn't know what to do. I applied to every job I could find, even ones that I was overqualified for, which is hard to explain, but no one would give me a chance. I felt defeated and hopeless. I'd never been in this position before, and I didn't know how to ask for help. Finally, the day came when I had to face my landlord. I gathered all the courage I could muster and went down to his property. He was a pretty stern man with a thick moustache that always seemed to be scowling. I explained my situation to him, hoping that he would understand, but he didn't. He gave me one last chance to come up with the rent money, but I knew it was impossible. 
I left his house with a heavy heart, knowing that I would soon be homeless. As the days passed, I started to pack up my belongings. I didn't have much time. I was still a painful process, but I had to get it done quick. I had to leave behind items that held sentimental value, but I knew I couldn't take everything with me. On the day of my eviction, I had nowhere to go. I'd spent the night on a bench in the park, knowing that I wouldn't be able to sleep in my apartment one last time. I watched as my belongings were thrown out onto the street, feeling a sense of shame and humiliation. I was now officially homeless. I spent the next few nights wandering the streets, trying to find a safe place to sleep. I was constantly on edge, afraid of being attacked or robbed. I'd never felt so vulnerable and scared in my life. I also struggled with a sense of worthlessness. I'd always been a hard worker, but now I had nothing to show for it. I felt like a failure, like I'd let myself and everyone around me down. I couldn't even provide for myself, let alone anyone else. As the weeks went by, I became more and more desperate. I would do odd jobs for people, like cleaning their yards or running errands, just to earn a few dollars. But it was never enough to get me off the streets. One night, I stumbled upon a homeless shelter. I was hesitant at first, but I was so tired and hungry that I decided to give it a try. Inside, I was greeted with warm smiles and a hot meal. I couldn't believe that there were people out there who were willing to help someone like me, a homeless stranger, for free. I started to go to the shelter every night, grateful for a warm bed and a meal, but I still felt a sense of shame and embarrassment being there. I never thought I would end up in a homeless shelter, and I didn't want anyone to know about my situation. One day, while I was out looking for odd jobs, I ran into an old acquaintance from my janitorial days. He was shocked to see me in my current state, and asked me what had happened. I reluctantly told him my story, feeling a mix of emotions. He was sympathetic, and offered to help find me a job. I was hesitant at first, not wanting to be a burden on anyone, but he insisted. He reached out to his contacts and was able to get me a job as a custodian at a local community centre. It wasn't much, and the pay was worse than the janitorial role, but it was a job, and it paid enough for me to get a small room in a shared house. I was grateful for this opportunity, and I threw myself into my work. I was determined to never end up on the streets again. I worked long hours and saved every penny I could. I also started to form relationships with my co-workers, something I had never done before. They were a kind and supportive group, and I felt like I finally belonged somewhere. Growing up, I was always taught to work hard and save my money. My parents, both immigrants from Mexico, worked tirelessly to provide for our family. They instilled in me the value of hard work and the importance of financial stability. And yet here I am, struggling to make ends meet with my main job and turning to odd jobs on the side just to earn some extra cash. I knew I needed to find a way to supplement my income if I ever wanted to save up enough money to get out of this shared house and into a nicer place of my own. That's when I stumbled upon the idea of doing odd jobs for people on the side. I started using sites like Facebook, Craigslist, eBay, where people would list jobs for everything, from dog walking to house cleaning. I figured I could use my spare time to do some of these odd jobs and earn some extra cash. I started off small, offering my services as a house cleaner. It was a bit embarrassing at first, as I'd never cleaned a house in my life. But I quickly got the hang of it, and even received some positive reviews from satisfied customers. 
I was amazed at how much money I could earn in just a few hours of work. I started taking on more and more odd jobs, from yard work to painting. I even started doing some freelance graphic design work on the side, using the skills that I learnt years ago from back in college. As the months went by, I found myself working almost every day after my main job. It was exhausting, but I was determined to save up enough money to move into a nicer place. I loved my job, but I knew I couldn't stay in my tiny shared house forever. I needed a change of scenery and a place to call my own. One day, while browsing through job listings on Craigslist, I came across a posting for a personal assistant. The pay was significantly higher than any of the other odd jobs I'd been doing, and the listing specifically mentioned that the job would be on the weekends. Since I was already working during the week, I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to earn even more money without sacrificing my main job. I responded to the listing, and to my surprise, I received a response almost immediately. The person on the other end introduced himself as Mr. Johnson, and explained that he needed someone to help him with errands and odd jobs on the weekends. He also mentioned that he would pay me $500 for each weekend I worked for him. It seemed too good to be true, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity. I met Mr. Johnson the following weekend, and he seemed like a nice guy. He was in his late 50s, I'd say, similar age to me. He lived in a pretty large house on the outskirts of the city. He showed me around and explained that he needed help with various tasks, such as grocery shopping, picking up dry cleaning, and organizing his home office. It all seemed pretty straightforward, and I was excited to start earning some extra cash. The first few weekends went by without a hitch. I completed all the tasks assigned to me, and Mr. Johnson was already very pleased with my work. He even started giving me bonuses for going above and beyond. This was paying me way more than my weekday job, and I was kind of hesitant to stop that though in case Mr. Johnson no longer needed me. I was feeling pretty good about myself, I was making insane money, and Mr. Johnson seemed happy with my work. Little did I know, things were about to take a dark turn. One weekend, Mr. Johnson asked me to do something that made me feel a bit uncomfortable. He asked me to pick up a package from a sketchy looking warehouse on the outskirts of the city, he said it was just a few boxes of office supplies, but something didn't feel right about this. I didn't want to lose my job though, or disappoint him, so I reluctantly agreed. When I arrived at the warehouse, I was met by a group of men who seemed to be very secretive and nervous. They handed me a large box and told me to deliver it to a specific location. I was now starting to get very worried and suspicious. I couldn't help but wonder what was inside the box, and why I was delivering it instead of Mr. Johnson. But again, I didn't want to lose my job, and I figured it was just a one-time thing. However, the following weekend, Mr. Johnson asked me to do the same thing. This time, he handed me an envelope filled with cash and asked me to deliver it to a different address. I knew something seriously wrong was going on, but the money was tempting, and I convinced myself that it was just a small favour for a wealthy man. As the weeks went by, these odd jobs for Mr. Johnson became more and more frequent. I started to feel like I was getting deeper and deeper into something illegal, but I was too scared to quit and the money was too good to pass up on. I convinced myself that I was just overthinking things, and that Mr. Johnson was a wealthy businessman who needed help with some shady business deals. One day, I was on my way to deliver another package for him. 
I was pulled over by the police unexpectedly. This was my first time ever being pulled over. I was immediately handcuffed and placed under arrest. It turns out, Mr. Johnson was involved in large-scale money laundering, and I had been unknowingly helping him by delivering packages and envelopes filled with thousands, tens of thousands, and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of cash. I was in shock. I couldn't believe what I had been caught up in. I was taken to the police station, where I was interrogated for hours. I explained everything to the police, how I found the job on Craigslist, and how I'd been blindly following Mr. Johnson's instructions without question. But it was no use. I ended up getting charged with aiding and abetting a criminal operation and was facing serious jail time. I was devastated. My parents had always taught me to stay away from trouble. And here I was, from homeless to facing prison. I couldn't believe I'd let my desire for money cloud my judgement and lead me down this path. I felt like a complete failure. And while the cops understood my situation, they thought that with a shadow of a doubt, they knew that what I was doing was illegal and that I should have known that. Eventually, after using basically half my money for a lawyer, they were able to negotiate a deal for me. I was able to avoid jail time. However, I was still charged with a misdemeanor and had to pay a hefty fine. My main job found out about the incident and I was let go for conduct unbecoming of an employee. I was back to square one with no job and a criminal record. It took me a long time to get back on my feet, both financially and emotionally. I had to move back in with my parents and start over, but it was a valuable lesson. I learned that sometimes the desire for more money can lead us down dangerous paths. I also realized the importance of questioning things and trusting my gut instincts. Today, I have a stable job and have learned to budget and save my money wisely. I no longer take on odd jobs on the side, and I always do thorough research before accepting any job offers. While I may still have the dream of moving into a nicer apartment, I now know that the financial stability and integrity are more important than any material possessions. Oh, and staying out of prison, that's also a bit important. It was a Tuesday, and Tuesday was a day that Max came round. When I first met Max, I was in second grade. We were fairly young, and at the time, just decided to hang out with each other. It was like, uh, the best of the worst, if that makes sense. Max was the only kid in the class that wasn't hyperactive, jumping up and down and screaming weird noises. I was drawn to his calmness and how chill he was. Ever since that day, I remember we just kept talking, until eventually, we had a friendship going. I started asking if he could sleep round my house. I think my mum's embarrassed about how small our house is, so every time, she would decline. Eventually, we came up with the plan of getting Max to ask his mum and dad if I could stay at theirs for the night. It started off by just staying over for one night during the weekends, but then eventually, we managed to somehow grab a routine out of this whole hobby. During the sleepovers, we would get virtually no sleep, maybe an hour at best if we got exhausted by the time it was four in the morning, but if we didn't, oh boy, was it fun. Let me first start by explaining what we'd do. 
Usually, mum and dad of Max would go out and then they would come back at around 8pm. I don't know why. Sometimes they'd come back with groceries. Other times they'd come back as if they'd been on a date or laughing. But they never had an issue leaving us home alone, even at such a young age. Once they came home, we calculated that they'd never come home later than half past midnight. Using this plan, we'd always wait until that time, just to make sure that they were fully home. Sometimes his mum and dad would be really quiet. I think that was because they didn't want to wake us up. But little did they know, we weren't even asleep. We were wide awake, waiting to devise a pretty bad plan. From running up and down the neighborhood at three in the morning, to going into people's backyards and taunting their annoying cats, there were some really fun things we ended up doing. And there were also times where we nearly got caught by a cop doing a patrol in the neighborhood. Things got further and further outlandish, to the point where we were pushing the limits. I have to be honest that this is when I saw a change in Max. He went from being that quiet, chill dude, to actually getting hooked on doing things pretty bad. Testing the patience of his parents, pushing the limits of the law, and how good we were at being escapists, and quiet. When you're running around someone's backyard at night, and they have those cameras, and those sensor lights, you better be hella quick to get the hell out of there when they do turn on. It's impossible to tell if they have these cameras or lights, until it's too late, and it's already seen you, by which time, you just gotta run. We also did some pretty bad things eventually, that I'm not too proud of and don't really want to admit, but I will, for heaven's sake. The first thing was stealing some food from a convenience store. I felt bad, as I soon realised that there was nothing cool about this, and if anything, we were just harming the people that owned the company. They weren't even a corporation. It was just a family run place, and I'm pretty sure they were struggling real bad, as there was always a whole bunch of stuff on discount whenever we'd go there. The best thing we ever did was finding someone's cat and having this full-on play session with it. The cat was in someone's backyard around eight houses down from Max's parents' house. In the yard was a bunch of toys, like a bull, a weird rod with a bit of fur on the end that it tries to claw and jump at at. It was funny, and we struggled to contain our laughter. But, a light came on in the house, and the second that did, we dropped all the toys and ran for our lives. I'm here to tell you about a time where we started using Craigslist as part of our devious plans. No, we didn't need cleaners. We weren't trying to advertise our services or skills, and we didn't want to sell our house. This is a bit different to your typical Craigslist horror story, but if you're willing to listen, then perhaps you'll get to the end. Me and Max started using Craigslist as just one big joke. Think of it like a playtime, but for a kid who just wants to mess around and basically take the piss out of people. It's hard to admit now, but the most fun we had was just messing with people, pranking them, setting them up, and lying. I'm not proud of it, but the story I'm about to tell was something that got us into a lot of trouble. Way too much trouble. That nearly cost us our lives? Question mark. We would reach out to the people posting the Craigslist ad. We'd pretend that we were someone we weren't and set up fake emails and accounts. Everyone would believe it and there was only ever one guy that asked us to do a phone call to prove who we actually were. Ranging from apparently meeting someone to buy their car to agreeing to clean an old lady's house seven hours a day. Some of the dumbest things we ever did had to have been setting people up for failure. Agreeing to buy something and then just never turning up. Or, the funniest one yet, a lady who was extremely old believed that we were going to turn up at 3 in the morning to collect an old TV that she was selling 
for 40 bucks. We told her to sit down on the porch, and this whole time, we were hidden behind some trash cans four houses down just from her. I'm pretty sure we were laughing so loud that she definitely heard us, but we couldn't help it. We were trying our best to stay as quiet as possible. It just wasn't working too well. One time, we decided that we were going to pretend to buy a house. Now this was the time that we actually got caught out on our luck. A man put up an ad for a house that was for sale for around about 200000 if I remember rightly. Now you have to remember, this was back in around 2011, so house prices are pretty much negligent compared to how they are today. We reached out to him and offered him 190 something, or around about near the offer. At this point, he didn't reply, but he simply ignored us. So Max decided to reach out again, this time putting in a counter offer even closer to the asking price. This intrigued the man and he finally replied, but he was insisting that we'd call him before we came to look at the house for a viewing. He told us that the agents would be present and that someone would be there the whole time. What ended up happening next? He demanded a phone call. Max and I tried everything we could to get out of doing that phone call, but nothing worked. The guy was so persistent that he flat out said to us, look, do the call or I'm no longer interested in selling this house to you. We realized that this was probably going to be our biggest and best prank yet. So, Max, having the deeper of the voice of two of us, decided that we were going to go ahead with this. And, well, you only live once. So, if the guy somehow figured that we were kids, whatever, we'd just block his number and move on to the next victim. The guy rang us and we were in Max's room. It was a Tuesday evening once again. We'd just come home from high school and were excited as hell for the whole day to be over so we could finally get on call with this guy. I didn't actually believe for a second that this guy was going to actually be convinced that Max was in his 40s. Putting on an artificially deep voice is so obvious, especially when you're still a teenager. Some kids can have deep voices and facial hair, but even then, it's usually still pretty easy to discern which ones are older and which ones aren't. I feel like voices age, it's hard to explain, but you can usually tell how old someone is just by hearing a recording of their voice for a brief few words. As Max answered the call, he put on the funniest and most stupid deep voice I've ever heard in my life, but I couldn't believe it. The guy was actually taking it for being real, or so we thought. He kept talking to Max, and Max was asking him questions about how many rooms there were, how many bathrooms, and how big the backyard was. It was all going so well, until Max ended up almost laughing too loud into the mic. There was an awkward silence, where the guy on the other side started saying, Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Max had to hold his breath and hold the laughter in. I walked out of the room as I was making things way worse. Oh boy, forget drugs, forget smoking and alcohol and women. Those laughs, the laughs where you feel like you're going to die because you can't breathe in air, that's the real good times. Wow. I left the room and Max continued with the call. I tried to put my ear up against the door but I couldn't really hear him. His parents came walking by and probably thought what the hell is he doing, but they just walked on by, not really paying us much attention. Once the call was over, Max came up to the door and opened it. I still had my ear against the door and he started laughing. Hey, two days, 6pm, he wants us there for a viewing. We burst out laughing and go back into his room. I don't know if his mum heard him, but he told me that out loud, all the way in front of the landing, and the corridor upstairs. 
We didn't actually think it would get this far, but here we were. We knew we had to make the most of it now, so we were going to go one step further. We were going to use the same tactic we had used, but then we realized everyone would still be awake. So how would we get away with hiding behind someone's trash can in broad daylight? Well, we didn't even get that far, because guess what? When we went back downstairs to get dinner, Max's mum was serving up, when all of a sudden we heard a knock at the door. Mum and dad of Max used to get a whole bunch of visitors. We didn't really pay any attention to them, and other than occasionally Max being called down to say hey to his cousins or some other weird visitors, I would never even go down there and speak to any of them. But this time, we had a visitor that we needed to talk to. As Max's mum was about to dish up, she puts the pan back down on the stove and quickly runs over to answer the door. I remember her muttering something like, Oh, who's that? I don't know who's that. Who am I expecting? When she gets over to the door, she answers it, and still me and Max aren't really paying any attention. She had been at the door for around a few minutes, when all of a sudden, a man walks into the house. Now this got my suspicions raised, as I recognised their cousins, I recognised their auntie and their uncle, but I didn't recognise this guy. He was bold, wearing glasses that were pretty blocky looking, and he had a fleece, jeans, and a pair of smart work shoes, the type you'd expect to be worn with a suit. The shoes were polished, and looked extremely shiny. As the man walked in, Max's mum shut the door behind her, but then something happened. All of a sudden, Max stopped playing on his phone, and froze dead, sat in place. He then looked up, and started staring at the guy, as if he was hell himself. I looked at Max, and I started nudging him with my elbow, as if Max was in disbelief of just some random bold guy stood in front of us. But there was so much more to it. As Max's mum continued asking the guy random, weird small talk questions, Max continued to stay frozen to the stool, waiting for our dinner to be served. The man sat down, and that was when I realised. Max was frozen, because he recognised the voice. It was the voice of the man who he had just pranked about selling his house on Craigslist. Yeah, he turned out to be a cop, tracked down the number, and ended up telling Max's mum all about it. He sat across the island from us in the kitchen on the other stool, laid his badge out on top of it, and had a stern warning towards us. That was pretty scary. We stopped the pranks after that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying tuned until the end of this video. If you enjoy the horror stories in today's video, then please consider leaving a like to show your support for the channel. Liking videos may seem pointless and annoying, but the real purpose of them is to actually help promote a video. Every time you like a video, it actually tells YouTube, hey, I like this video, please show more people it on your algorithm. This means a lot to me as I'm struggling to get more views on this channel, as the competition in the horror story niche is crazy high. There are a lot of automation channels, corporation channels, and AI channels that steal stories off of the internet. Please, we need to crack down on these channels and stop them. They're earning money from other people's stories that they wrote on Reddit without asking permission. It's important that you know the channel you're listening to didn't do this, and with my channel, I can guarantee that none of the stories are stolen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed today's video and you're new here, and you haven't already subscribed, also consider joining the channel by clicking the red subscribe button. I try and upload one video every evening. It's very difficult though, as it's a one-man army, 
I don't have any editors or teams behind me. It's just me on my own in my bedroom. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for all the support. I hope you're all doing well and I'll catch you in tomorrow's video.